Good afternoon and welcome to the third outcome area working group meeting for workforce and economic development. A few housekeeping items before we begin. This meeting is being recorded and we will post the recording of this meeting, the slides and transcripts to the Broadband for All portal. We have a few um, additional options for those that are looking for them. We both have closed captioning available and that'll be on the bottom toolbar. We will be in, um, implementing and using chat. Um, so please, one of the first asks is to put your name, um, any pronouns in your organization and title where you're joining us from so we can say, all say hello to each other. And finally, we are using reactions in the raise your hand feature you can see right here on the screen. The reactions is on the lower toolbar with a little smiley face. So when we get to the community discussion, we'd love for you to raise your hand and, and join the conversation. Finally, we do have ASL interpretation. If you cannot see them currently, please look at the top right where it has view and select gallery. Next slide. Here's today's agenda. Um, we'll start with an overview of key takeaways uh, from the first two meetings held in February and March. We'll then hear from a panel of subject matter experts who will address the unique barriers faced by the covered populations they serve, what their organizations are doing to address these barriers, and what solutions they have seen as effective. Then we'll proceed to uh, the interactive discussion about the lived experiences of those impacted by the digital divide and include discussion with you all um, and wrap up with calls to action and next steps. So next slide, I'm going to hand it off to Rita Fayez, who's a graduate student assistant from Berkeley Goldman School of Public Policy to provide us a brief synopsis of the last two meetings. Rita? Hi, everyone. Um, so we'll go through our takeaways from the February meeting first, um, which revolved around digital barriers uh, discussion. The first uh, barrier that in some that exists in some rural and urban areas is that of broadband infrastructure, um, which leads to people who live there not having affordability, um, affordability or um, many choices to choose from. Um, secondly, barriers related to language and culture were also brought up as a key issue. For language in particular, there's a need for training and apprenticeship programs to be available in multiple languages, so as to empower underserved communities um, that exist within this covered population. Similarly, on the cultural barrier aspect, having community champions from within these communities within our covered, covered populations is essential to encourage participation and retention in programs designed to address digital equity. Uh, next, the need for cross-agency and cross-organization coordination um, is important so that organizations can build upon each other's programs um, and have the maximum impact and also are able to identify any gaps. Lastly, with regard to pathway programs and vocational trainings, it is really important to double down on our efforts to connect trainees with industry and encourage industry participation overall. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so in the March meeting, the following cha challenges and solutions uh, were brought up. Um, firstly, the need for workforce development apprenticeship programs to be available in multiple languages um, is really key so that we are uh, inclusive of all communities. Once again, a cross entity partnership was re reiterated in this meeting. Um, thirdly, um, the role of educational entities was emphasized um, as they are already engaged with many of our co covered populations and are well trusted um, parts of the community. So investing them and supporting such organizations can help us meet our digital equity and workforce development goals. Our last two points here um, are related to uh, the need to go to need to meet communities where they are and to do long term uh, community work through community champions to transform their identities in terms of uh, helping people feel more comfortable in engaging with technology. Awesome. Thank you so much for the review and reminders uh, and setting us forward on the next steps, Rita. And, and um, congratulations and appreciate all your help getting through the um, graduate student assistance and helping us with all the state digital equity work. 
So next we will move on to um, hearing from our subject matter experts and, and, and sharing what digital equity programs they're currently working on well in their communities and why and what's missing. And so we'll start with Leo Sosa, founder and CEO of Dev Mission. Leo. Thank you all. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'm a little bit under the weather, so hopefully I will not be able to, uh, in case I choke, just give me a minute to grab some water. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Leo Sosa. I started Dev Mission six and a half years ago to close two gaps within digital inclusion or broadband adoption or digital equity, if you call it. One gap is the high school students are not being exposed to STEM subjects in the San Francisco area. And on top of that, we have the diversity gap at the tech industry. So my organization has been able to address that with a registered pre-apprenticeship program, which targets young adults ages 16 to 24 with a registered apprenticeship bootcamp style training, where these young people come for 12 weeks, they learn different competencies from internet things, IT essentials, programming skills, and critical career skills. Along well, hold on, Leo, you accidentally got muted. Let's just go there back go. just a little bit. There okay, there we go. What did you all miss? <laughs> uh, no, you. we dropped you right as you were explaining your next step after the, the um, program. Okay, gotcha. So um, the program runs for 12 weeks. Uh, we serve young people from the Bay Area and beyond. And as they come into the program, they go into multiple competencies uh, from IoT, IT essentials, programming, and career skills. Once they graduate from the program, they receive a stipend, they receive a laptop, and they get a mentor. But that training is typically what we call the re-entry part to become an apprentice within the IT essentials. As I mentioned, we're the only registered pre-apprenticeship program in the San Francisco area. And if I'm not mistaken, we're the second registered pre-apprenticeship program in the entire state of California through the Division of Apprenticeship Standards. Great accomplishment for doing that since I started this work six and a half years ago. So you're probably wondering how we're closing this digital divide, digital inclusion. Well, these young people that graduate from a program become part of our employment career pathways model. I've been doing this work for 25 years and even Scott here on this call saw the initial of Digital Connectors and the Community Technology Associate when I was working with One Economy Corporation. So I took that idea and bet it within my organization. And now we're offering digital literacy training in seven affordable housing communities in San Francisco, where we have technicians that are pursuing careers in the tech industry, providing free tech support, providing digital literacy training, distributing computers. We have an event called Refurbatons, where we provide computers to affordable housing communities. And these young people that graduated from the pre-apprenticeship program are earning workplace learning, hands-on experience, and also they're getting the Google IT and CompTIA A plus certification. So we're not only to close the diversity gap at the tech industry, but we also closing this huge digital divide in San Francisco. I've been an affordable housing resident. I was part of the In an Essential program and the AT&T Access All program. So to me, it's very important the young people in communities of color continue to receive the resources that we have available. I'm very excited to announce that this summer, we're launching three pre-apprenticeship programs in San Francisco. One in partnership with Goodwill SF of Bay Area, another one with San Francisco City College at the Mission Campus, our own very registered pre-apprenticeship program, and we're also launching our first satellite program in the city of East Oakland. So very excited to see how this program continues to evolve as we close the digital divide together with young people that are becoming the next pipeline for the tech industry. But most importantly, they're the technology ambassadors that continue to help low-income families get access to broadband, get access to computers, and relevant content. So that's how we're closing this digital divide with my organization. Leo, that is a lot of really great um, information. I, I love the mission. I love what you're sharing. Um, so thank you so much. And um, I think one of the things that gets me is that it's really, it's we're going beyond expanding programs. Um, and it's really about 
building and creating that pipeline of enabling folks to be in not just the broadband sector, but tech careers. And I think that's really, really valuable. As someone who comes from uh, a rural region, it is one of the things that we talked about. And as a past economic development director, talking about how we can encourage and build that pipeline of being tech career driven too, but out here in the in the in the rural central Sierra. So really important work. Really appreciate your workforce development and expanding opportunities and representation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Leo. Uh, next is Laura, who's the vice president of external affairs for Bitwise. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Um, and thanks, Leo, for that awesome introduction and also all of the great work that you're uh, leading over there. It's so needed. Um, so I am Laura Maristani. I am the head of external affairs for Bitwise Industries. For those who may not be aware, Bitwise is a technology company that is based and headquartered in Fresno, California. And since 2013, we have been building technology economies in underestimated cities. We really believe that the elements that make up Bitwise lines of business are ne the necessary elements of increasing digital equity in communities across the country. So I'm going to very quickly walk you through that. I actually come from doing work in the civil rights space, and I always like to go back to 2013 when the conversation we were having was much more anchored in how do we create more folks that are skilled in STEM um, um, occupations. And part of what we saw since then is that we did really great work in training people um, into STEM careers, but a lot of them couldn't stay home because the rest of the elements needed for them to actually leverage those skills to promote economic development to strengthen their communities weren't in place. And so I think that now we um, obviously have a lot more learning under our belt on what are those elements. And I, and I think this conversation obviously being backed with some of the dollars that are gonna come to help us do that more um, effectively is, is kind of where I wanna anchor us as we think about what we have built in Fresno and now in 10 cities across the country. So our, um, our work starts with technology solutions. We are building technology solutions across our community, but in particular with anchor institutions. So a lot of our clients are actually schools, their libraries, their local government, their local nonprofits. And it is in those places that we are helping to strengthen digital infrastructure. So whether it is working with that local school district, to develop a um, better platform that is able to engage students more meaningfully, more inclusively, or it's working with micro and small businesses to help figure out what kind of platforms they need to manage their finances more effectively or uh, reach uh, constituents and clients more effectively. What is unique is how we source that um, technology. So we are a registered apprenticeship program with the Department of Labor. And we pull folks from our communities, a lot of them uh, people that are outside of traditional paths into the workforce. So in fact, of the over 10,000 folks that we've trained, many of them, the majority of them are over 24 years old. They um, have not been in traditional pathways into the workforce, and they are participating in pre-apprenticeship programs like the one that Leo is running um, and others, which Bitwise also used to run in the Central Valley for, for a little bit. So those folks, that single mom that could not find the information on that school website is the mom that is working with the school district to think about what that solution looks like long term. So we feel very strongly and we see it over and over again um, that the product itself becomes a, a solution that creates more inclusion, that encourages more participation, that is able to reach the community more meaningfully because the people behind it are the people from those communities that understand and have been in many cases shut out of technology um, are the ones that are solving for it. The third piece of what we do, which is super important um, to think, you know, how we anchor digital equity in our community is community building. So we revitalize like downtown spaces to house that ecosystem. In Fresno, many of our buildings have sat empty for many years in our downtown. We turn them into these castles, beautiful, vibrant spaces that create curiosity about technology in our communities. And in those spaces, we have 
low cost co-work options around $29 a month in some of our Central Valley locations, because we want to make sure that those entrepreneurs, the, uh, the apprentices, other tech entrepreneurs in the community can find themselves in a space where they can run into the next big idea, where in the coffee shop, you know, they can come up with the next big idea with their fellow technologists. You're not going to run into that in, in the Central Valley like you would in San Francisco, perhaps. And so that is very important to anchor it. But within that ecosystem, we also are very focused on entrepreneurship development and digital literacy. So even to do the first two pieces and the Bitwise Apprenticeship Program, one key distinction is while we do hire a lot of the folks, we really are envisioning that our apprentices are going to be the next IT lead at the school district or the next IT lead at the um, local government agency. To get to that point, we have to increase demand for their skills and talents locally. And so digital literacy program is very important to that. Our uh, entrepreneur entrepreneurship um, programs also help make sure that there are other technology companies that are sprouting in the communities around them so that they too can become the next um, spaces for them to go and work. And so what those look like, Bitwise has a venture capital arm where we're able to do um, some small seed funding to support tech entrepreneurship or our digital empowerment programs with the city of Fresno where we're doing IT skills development for micro and small business owners. So together, all of those pieces in place help ensure that there is both um, workforce development, but that there is demand for that workforce long-term so that folks can stay and simultane simultaneously put those talents in favor of developing more inclusive technology that is able to pull everyone in. So again, very grateful to be a part of this conversation and look forward to engaging with questions and fellow panelists. No, thank you, Laura. Thank you so much for joining and sharing. I think we think that, I mean, broadly, digital inequities, right, create um, disparate outcomes in both the education uh, and the career outcomes. So really, the, the impact we're having is there's economic development, like you're having, you're having economic development underserved communities or historically underserved communities. And, and we're all building towards digital equity and inclusion that's equitable of opportunities and prosperity regardless of geography, right? And so that's, I think, one of the things that's been really outstanding and impressive to watch with Bitwise and, and seeing what training and, and tools and both in those tools, how they empower opportunities and create um, um, increased outcomes. So really excited and um, back, uh, uh, en enjoyed our visit to Bitwise back when you hosted the feds in the States. So very, thank you much, Laura, and look forward to having you join the conversation some more. Thanks, Cole. Next, we'll invite um, Caitlin Blockus, who's the project manager from Valley Vision. Caitlin? Thank you, Cole, and uh, thank you everyone for having us here today. Uh, my name is Caitlin Blockus, and I am a project manager at Valley Vision. And for folks who haven't heard of us before, we are a civic leadership organization and nonprofit uh, based in Sacramento, but we serve the nine county um, capital region, which is a, a fairly uh, geographically diverse area, which encompasses both urban, agricultural, and rural, uh, you know, rural uh, ecosystems. And uh, we have a variety of uh, digital inclusion and, and also workforce initiatives. So I will try not to talk your ear off too much about it. Um, but most notably, uh, one being our the broadband consortium, the Connected Capital Area Broadband Consortium that Valley Vision manages. Uh, is a part of this project, we work with different local cities and counties uh, to incentivize broadband adoption. We also work with internet service providers to expand broadband infrastructure within these counties. So that is one component of our work. Another is the uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the Capital Region Coalition for Digital Inclusion, which started out of a report done by the, Brook the Brookings Institute in 2019, which compared Sacramento to other middleweight regions in the country. This includes cities like Miami, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, Riverside, California. And it found that Sacramento was really sort of behind some of these other middleweight cities in regards to our digital skills and digital literacy. And as a result of that report, our coalition was born, you know, in combination with working with our local library system, uh, funding from our the local workforce boards and other local partners. 
And so that coalition uh, does a variety of, of activities, including convening these partners and really creating a group for folks to come together, sharing resources and being able to support the community in a variety of ways. One of the projects that the coalition has worked on is launching the Capital Region Digital Inclusion Portal, which we, uh, uh, which serves the region as a sort of kind of one-stop shop asset mapping tool for individuals, community members, anyone to be able to connect to a variety of digital inclusion resources that they need. And forgive me, my neighbor has decided this is a great time to mow the lawn. So I'm gonna get a lot closer to the microphone here. Um, but we're ex really excited to have this portal because it gives that access directly to the community. Anybody can go online and search for what they need, whether that's a computer for your child for school, affordable broadband connection, a variety of things. Um, and so that's another, or another project that we offer. In addition to our work through the consortia, through the coalition, we've also partnered with Biteback, which uh, has a digital navigator program that they have launched in Sacramento. Biteback originally started in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Maryland, and has a variety of different workforce development and also digital inclusion programs. So we're really excited to partner with them and their digital navigator program. In addition to that, we, as coming out of the coalition, but also focusing on digital navigators, we have received a grant um, in partnership with Sacramento State University through the NTIA's Connecting Minority Communities pilot program, which will uh, essentially take Sacramento State students and deploy them as digital navigators into the area of Lemon Hill, which is the most impoverished community in Sacramento County. So those are a variety of our projects. I could probably talk your, your ears off a bit more about that, but I'm sure we'll dive into it later in this panel. So thank you. No, thank you, Caitlin. And thank you for sharing so much. And I, we've seen you and Valley Vision show up to a lot of regional events and get to hear about all the impact and work um, that your um, Valley Vision is doing. And I think it's really important to note kind of what resonates when we hear of Valley Vision's work is kind of the cycle that your work and workforce and economic development and digital equity has where how digital literacy and skills training um, or lack thereof impact regional workforce and economies. And then that by the work that Valley Vision does to work with partners to take action um, increases both digital inclusion, but then it also through economic development improves the local economy, right? So we're empowering one another. And I think that's really, really cool. And, and, and thank you for sharing. Thank you, Caitlin. Look forward to having you continue to join this conversation. Next, I'd like to, and uh, in, in, we'd like to invite Sean uh, Wilcock, who's the VP of Business Development at Imperial Valley Economic Resource Center. Sean. Thank you, Cole. And uh, thank you for having us here today. Um, uh, before I before I get into you know what our challenges are, I'd like to kind of geographically help you guys understand you know where we are in the state of California. And so we're the only county in the state of California that borders another country and another state. So we're all the way down on the Mexican border. We're in the corner with Mexico and Arizona, and with that comes very unique challenges and also opportunities um, is even as far as uh, workforce that crosses over from Mexico and and Arizona on a daily basis, but it also- John, can I pause crazy. you real fast? I'm gonna, oh, there you are, Denise, you froze for a second. Okay, we're back. Go ahead, Sean, I apologize. And, and so in addition to the workforce um, benefits and challenges, it also um, presents a platform for uh, additional competition between us, Mexico, and Arizona. So it's a constant, um, you know, battle for us to to stay relevant. But um, I will say with all confidence, um, the other counties may challenge this statement, but I will say that we have more projects in the state of California than any other county. Um, we're, we're sitting on right now where we, we're facilitating about $40 billion worth of projects. And many of you may or may not have heard of Lithium Valley, but that's really only about 25% of what we're working on currently. Um, but our county is, is about the same size as San Diego. So geographically, we're large. Uh, we're very rural. We only have 187,000 people. And a lot of our um, industry is agriculture, seasonal agriculture, um, energy production, we export a lot of power uh, to other counties and other states because of our geothermal 
uh, resource that we have here, which that also is connected with the lithium extraction uh, industry that you may, be, may have heard of. Um, but, you know, these facilities are in very rural areas um, and they're not necessarily close to population. So what that creates is a scenario where, you know, we have these um, underserved businesses and, and these underserved uh, popu uh, residential populations a few miles away. And so whether the populations like it or not, industry is really what's a driver of uh, the last mile and middle mile connectivity. And so one of the challenges that we've had is we've identified industry needs um, and we've identified that the existing facilities that we have around the Salton Sea that will be adopting lithium extraction activities. But today they're suffering with connection speeds that are comparative to DSL. And so you've got several hundred million dollar facilities that have very deficient broadband connectivity. And then you have future developments that are, are permitting in the area that represent about 10 to $12 billion worth of investment that will be there for the next 30 years. So when we go to the ISPs and we say, look, what better customers could you possibly want than ones that are making such huge investments and ones that are gonna be there for such a long period of time. But because of all the groundwork that I, I kind of described about our rural nature, our underserved nature, by the way, we're 85% uh, Hispanic population. And so you have a lot of un unrepresented um, folks here as well as the businesses. And when, when we put all this in front of the ISPs, they, it, it, it's difficult to get them on board and, and invest in anything um, to, to solve the problem. So that is, our, that is our big challenge is getting the ISPs to come forward make investments where we kind of consider ourselves as a third tier county where, you know, it's, it's hard to get the ISPs to, to care about us because they don't see the ROI on their investment. But uh, we continue um, to stay involved by being a part of state run programs like Get Connected California and, and in our work with the affordable um, connectivity program. And by the way, we have, um, we have, we're the highest um, adoption, we have the highest adoption rate in the state. So 68% of our population are, are eligible for ACP. And of that 68%, we've had 77% adoption. Now we lead the state and number two is Kern County with 54% adoption. So we, you know, we really uh, excel in, in getting, uh, you know, folks signed up for that program. But um, you know, we have three programs within our office, the Southern Border Broadband Consortium that advocates for broadband needs um, in San Diego and Imperial County, and then the Imperial Valley Business Resource Center, um, who continues to survey needs for the business community and workforce needs, and then, and then the organization that I work for, which is the parent organization of Imperial Valley Economic Development Corporation, which continues to map out the needs of industry. Um, and so during the pandemic, we found ourselves in a pretty unique situation. We were uh, the Cal OES distribution company for our county. And so we found ourselves in a position to be uh, engaging and dialoguing with a whole different population of our county than, than, than we had before. And so as we were distributing PPE, we were talking to residents um, that we weren't able to before. And we were talking to business owners who needed that PPE and we were able to assess, you know, kind of what their, what their broadband issues were. Um, and then we're also working, you know, we, we continue to have roundtable meetings uh, periodically with ISPs, industry, um, and, um, and continue to forward that information on to our state partners. Um, you know, one of the things, the other challenge, you know, with the amount of projects that we have coming into our, into our county is that um, we don't, you know, we've got all these big industrial projects with the Valley. Hey, Sean, can yes. I interrupt you? Sure. Before, before we go further, I feel like it's worth <laughs> no to interrupt you because I want you to say it again, 77% of eligible households are enrolled 
in ACP, the Affordable Connectivity Program in Imperial. Uh, Correct. It's like you said, it's it's astounding. 77%. Yep. That's like more than clapping. That's just, it's amazing. So I think one of the things and why I wanted to interrupt you is before you went further is kind of how, right? Like right. what are what, what lessons learned can we learn from you to share with the rest of the state about what tactics you're using or what Imperial is using to get that a much um, adoption into affordable connectivity program. I think it's worthwhile to talk about. Yeah, sure. I mean, so so we have very um, we have a lot of connectivity with our regional partners and our statewide partners, um, our transportation commission, our office of education, um, the county, the libraries, the schools, uh, you name it, the cities, um, and we're able to leverage those uh, assets to get the word out um, on these programs. But we also um, ourselves, we had um, sign up events in some of our underserved communities um, in Palapatria and Heber and El Centro, Calexico. Um, and we went out there, our staff went out there on you know Saturdays and, and we you know helped line up lines of people that were coming to get uh, signed up for the ACP program. But you know the funny thing happened, we were up in Calapatria at a, at a library. And they said, sure, we got internet. And we go up there, we set up our, our sign-up event, and they're using a cell phone hotspot uh, for internet at, at a library, you know? And, and that's just, you know, that's just, we find that uh, ironic and, and kind of insufficient. But, um, you know, I would say adding to our challenges, um, back to the, pro the projects that we have, um, we have a, we're going to have a workforce crisis on our hands. We don't have enough people to, to go to work, which is, a, a, you know, a good thing, but, um, you know, we're creating tens of thousands of jobs and, uh, in one or two industries and, and we don't have the, um, educational curriculum delivery here in Imperial Valley. So we're relying on a lot of distance learning and how do people, how do people do distance learning when they don't have connectivity? You know, so that's that's one of the big challenges that we have. So, no, thank you, Sean. Uh, lots of great strategies, ideas, and advice. And again, seventy per seven percent of enrolled households are eligible that are eligible in Imperial County are part of affordable connectivity program. So, bravo again. Um, it just shows that kind of collective action um, for entities that are promoting ACP. And your partnership, it really does aware, raise awareness and then adding in those actual on-site enrollment events, um, it, it speaks volumes to why they're 77%. And I hope it's a model that we can continue to all collectively work towards. So again, thank you so much, Sean. Thank, um, you. And thank you for adding into this conversation. Finally, um, we're going to have Michael Younger, who's the VP of Workforce Strategy and Innovation at Calbright. Um, Michael? Yeah, thank you so much. And it was just incredible to hear from uh, my uh, fellow panelists here uh, representing, you know, areas with uh, the greatest amount of need across the across the state uh, and very much uh, change agents across across the board. So grateful for their comments. Uh, my name is Michael Younger. I'm the v VP of uh, Workforce Strategy and Innovation at Calbright College. Um, Calbright is um, a part of California's the, the, the nation's largest community college system. Right, um, and we were created in 2018 and acted into state law in 2019 um, as essentially a statewide workforce development catalyst to support economically stranded uh, working age Californians ages 25 and older. That's a target population uh, that, as we all know, is uh, uh, you know, under under resourced uh, in terms of, of those being at the uh, at the margins of the you know, economic uh, environment. And uh, we also know that they're not well researched as well. And, 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 and in terms of higher education, uh, individuals that lack uh, a degree that fall into this target population uh, haven't had uh, in large uh, numbers entities to be able to support them from a higher education perspective, uh, considering um, the weight that they're carrying as well, uh, be it caregivers, uh, uh, parents, uh, and having other responsibilities outside of just pursuing higher education. So uh, at Calbright, uh, we're fully online. Um, we are competency-based model, so it's not just an online provider. Uh, it's truly, we start 
uh, with the online infrastructure uh, at the forefront of how we build and we build uh, based on uh, economic um, uh, community uh, equity and looking at the human centered approach right um, we're flexible we're accessible um, again we're we have a statewide lens so uh, unlike some of our sister institutions we're able to be uh, additive to the overall Ca uh, California community college system because some of our inst uh, sister institutions are more regionally focused we're, we're statewide so we add uh, capacity to the overall California community college system and so for those that uh, you know have you know, uh, you know, challenges commuting and can't attend a class in a traditional working, uh, traditional classroom environment, uh, Calbright uh, ha has been a solution for them, right? So our programs are um, our programs focused on emerging careers, growing sectors. We talked a little bit, uh, and you've heard a little bit about that from 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 uh, our partner actually at Bitwise and Lawrence uh, spoke about all the great work they're doing. But our programs are, are situated in like IT support, uh, Salesforce administration. But we have a growing portfolio also uh, in terms of graphic design, animation, uh, user experience, and user inter interface as well. Um, and you know, really, our strong focus on workforce development. And so they're preparing graduates uh, to enter growing fields that really stretch across multiple sectors in the in the economy. And so a part of our kind of secret sauce is that we're we're providing devices to our students uh, outside of it just being a free program. We're providing devices to the extent folks don't have uh, devices, uh, hotspots, and others being able to provide that. But duly noted from from our co-panelists in terms of uh, also ISPs need to be involved in, in terms of being able to help address the need. Uh, for 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 access uh, to to mobile towers and others, and so we, we we aren't really taking classroom content and trying to mold it into an environment of online. We're actually building our infrastructure, designing from an online uh, mindset from the start. So we've you know done the research and we we know about the in demand skills. We're we're partnering, collaborating with a lot of labor market entities uh, to be able to have a pulse on industry uh, and where it's growing. Uh, and we're really creating a solution to meet uh, people where they are, right? Bringing them uh, into this flexibly, flexibly paced environment um, as well. And so nine out of 10 Calbright students actually credit um, the college's kind of student-centered approach uh, and uh, competency-based uh, model as why they've enrolled uh, in Calbright. You may ask, who, who, who are you serving, right? And so we're, again, we're serving across the state, uh, but 90% of our, you know, uh, 25 500 students now, just, just short of 2,500 students uh, are uh, 25 years and older, uh, double the community college uh, system rate. Uh, and uh, not only that, uh, they are 70-80% uh, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color. We have 21% um, African American, 36% uh, Hispanic, 22% identify as Asian and Pacific Islander, uh, but 34% are parents, right? And that's triple uh, the community college rate uh, in the state of California. So, you know, higher education, again, uh, doesn't uh, do the best serving these populations. And so, um, uh, you know, our position uh, is that it's a shared challenge, right, with entities you, you've heard here and our other sister institutions, too, to be able to address this population and serve them well. Uh, and so we, we present a unique capacity to be able to, to, to do that. Uh, but we also very much know uh, that there are limitations to what uh, higher education can provide, and that's why community-based organizations, workforce intermediaries, partnerships are very important for a Calbright uh, to ensure that uh, beyond the learning journey, uh, there's also work-based learning opportunities. Uh, and so, the one that I would uh, you know call out is our partnership with Bitwise. Right, uh, we are standing up uh, a pre uh, and then a formal registered apprenticeship program where the pre apprenticeship starts at Calbright. Right, that six to twelve month journey. Uh, in terms of uh, both uh, enrolling, matriculating through your studies at Calbright in our um, competency-based education model, connecting uh, to a, a registered apprenticeship program at Bitwise as a direct pipeline uh, into an industry experience um, paired with a senior developer, giving uh, individuals uh, an opportunity to have uh, work experience right, right away and gives them that best foot forward as they enter that long-term full-time job market. 
uh, significant. We just launched a cohort in Oakland and we'll be expanding to Central Valley and others with our partners in Bitwise. And so we're excited about this. It's a first of its kind for um, the unique setup of this model uh, for the state. And we're, we're excited to expand this model uh, as, as we move forward. But it's, it's understanding uh, the core competencies and understanding your limitations and why you really need to um, you know, involve others at the workforce and economic development table uh, in a way that strengthens the ecosystem, right? And brings more voices uh, and core attributes to the table. And so we're excited uh, to be a catalyst in this effort. We're excited to be able to ensure that we prepare uh, individuals uh, that have been historically underserved with opportunities for higher education because they too can achieve and be successful uh, in the workforce. Michael, so, so much great information. Um, and I think it's really, um, important to reiterate like how your programs are specifically designed for workforce for internet for text-based jobs it's just it fits so in line with everything that we've been talking about and it's really exciting for the opportunity for you to share and for all of us to kind of hear more about Calbright and pursue the opportunity of Calbright and bringing it uh, to more programs across the state and more partnerships so really excited to have Calbright join uh, and at this point, actually, I'm hoping to have Deputy Director Scott Adams, who's the Deputy Director of Office of Broadband and Digital Literacy, to join in and share a couple um, thoughts. Scott? Yeah, well, thanks, Cole. And uh, well, thanks to the um, presenters and the panelists. Like, just um, such great work doing. And we, we know that there are many other folks in the space that are, are doing this great um, work and it's and it's from all corners of the state and all of the communities and that's really the the focus of of um digital equity and the the broadband for all program here um i think what i, I just continue to be present by is how um you know the the current state of digital inequity creates disparate outcomes um in in so many different ways um in terms of um attainment of education of career and, and life outcomes. And that, you know, the important work that we're all doing, and particularly these folks that we heard from, you know, acknowledge that there's the 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 <laughs> broadband adoption piece that leads to um digital inclusion. And then it's it's through like a digital equity environment that we all, you know, <laughs> hope to capitalize on these really once in a hundred year investments that have come to, to the state to create um you know digital opportunity and, and digital thriving that's regardless of of place or income or um ethnicity or um or ableness and so um just thoroughly inspired by the work that you are all doing and and sharing with us and really the the focus is um you know making sure that that we learn from from what you all are doing. I mean, so many different examples from Leo and, and San Francisco and, um, you know, running programs to um, increase representation of underrepresented, you know, populations in, 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 the, um, in the tech industry. I mean, we, we need to have the, the workers of the next economy, you know, be diverse and dispersed and representative of this vibrant, you know, state that we all live in and and Caitlin the work that you all are doing um you know with Valley Vision I mean just proactively taking collective action to um you know identify a need and then um you know work together to 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 really um you know set set the region on a path forward um to future success I mean the same can be said Sean for the work that you guys are all doing and and um, aside from, you know, all the, the, the different projects that you have in, you know, Imperial County, um, it's just a, a really great example that Cole said is like the, the affordable connectivity, you know, um, you've got people signing people up, you know, on mobile phones powered by hotspots and you're at 77%. So there's some really good best practices there and, you know, Obviously, bit wise, the, the work that you're doing is just amazing. And Michael, I think the thing that was really interesting about the work that Calbright's doing is how um, your population, the student population base, really kind of maps out 
you know, for the covered populations that the digital equity plan is, um, you know, intended to direct investments towards. And, um, you know, you mentioned those like tailoring the, the education so that it's flexible based on the individual constraints of those populations, building in the infrastructure to support that, like um, really laudable, um, how you're factoring, factoring, you know, you've got online education that's free. Um, to empower opportunity, but acknowledging that you need to provide that hardware and that connectivity in order to, to do that. And so again, just humbled and grateful for being able to, to hear and learn from you all about um, some of these you know, related examples that we want to make sure that these investments, that the, the infrastructure dollars that come to build the infrastructure, um, or leverage to create opportunity for covered populations, but that um, we don't stop at just digital literacy for folks. And we don't stop at digital equity, meaning you're connected and you have a device, but it's like, it is that digital success where you know folks can share in that prosperity. So um, again, thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Deputy Director Adams for joining and sharing. And, and now I'd like to, um, bring the slides back up and again express my appreciation for all those that presented this morning or this afternoon really appreciate all of the great information that you've shared and and really now um, hoping that both the panelists and all those that are in attendance will now uh, join us in, in a community discussion um, next slide we're really hoping for conversation on the experiences of those impacted by the digital divide um, and really understand your experiences, understand your successes, understand your organizations, um, uh, programs, and really share um, information related to these three questions. Um, we don't have to cover these one by one. If you have interest to share information on the actions your organization are taking, if you wanna share about any programs, or share about what you think is missing or what we needed. Um, this is the time we can take um, comments or a conversation both by chat, um, but really this is an opportunity to call, um, to raise your hand. There we go, raise your hand using the reactions feature um, and we'll unmute you and offer you the op time, opportunity to join the conversation. I really look forward to it. And I already see hands raised, so we'll just jump right in. Um, Anissa. I'm going to go ahead and you can unmute. Hi, I'm Anissa Beatty. I'm the Senior Digital Inclusion Program Lead for the International Rescue, Rescue Committee in San Diego. So our digital inclusion program is about three years old, but really two years old. We run a workforce cohorts for refugee populations. And I'm really interested to hear what other people's experiences are as well, but we, we really focus on basic skills um, because we're serving populations that have just arrived or they may have been here for, for decades, but they really were never connected to technology, digital literacy. We also work with American small business owners. So a really wide range of communities that kind of were left behind. Um, we provide free um, Chromebooks, MacBooks, and uh, laptops. We haven't been successful in ACP because it takes so long and we don't have the staff capacity to, to offer that. We've purchased our own hotspots for our cohorts. Um, and right now we're getting ready to do a study to evaluate how our workforce cohorts are functioning. Um, our organization has other, you know, small business and uh, entry into the workforce programs. We really are the first place that our clients enter our pi pipeline. So we, we try to offer things that aren't offered by other organizations because most of our clients don't have access because of language or because of immigration status. They don't have legal status yet. Thank you, Anissa, for sharing both some of the, the, the struggles um, of your, your program, but also some of the successes and also sharing uh, the, the folks that you do work with. And um, Deputy Director Adams, do you have anything to share? 
Well, I just wanted to say thank you, Anissa, for bringing us back to the 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 kind of what we kicked off the the first. Um, workforce and economic development, the digital equity working group meeting is we heard from um, the, the folks from the National Digital Skills Coalition that um, provided some information about research they did and, and really um, want to um, acknowledge what you were saying is that for many of the, the, the covered populations that um, there is a need for, for just the basic digital skills and so not to like jump over that. Um, and, and to, to say that, you know, both basic digital skills, intermediate and then advanced are gonna be required for all of California's residents to fully succeed and, and thrive. So um, really appreciate the role that, that your organization is playing there. And I think bringing in the, the, the small businesses, um, you know, is really critical. And one of the things that um, Rita, our graduate student, you know, we, I think she she pointed out that it was like in both of the previous meetings that in order for um, you know our digital equity workforce and economic development efforts to be truly successful, that um, building in the capability to to do training and, and apprenticeship programs that are in language that um, can cater to the diversity of our population is something that's really critical. So I just wanted to thank you for for. Um, being a voice um, for for those folks that you're working with. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, Anissa. Um, next, we will pass the mic to Jennifer. Jennifer? Hi, thanks for, um, first of all, organizing this and giving me a moment to, uh, to share about our work. Sorry, I have a phone ringing in the background just at this moment. Um, so I represent an organization called Empower. We're a national nonprofit that's focused on forging pathways to tech careers for people from underserved communities and underrepresented populations. Um, very similar to the work that Calbright does and Bitwise does, and um, love to partner with you guys, actually. We're in both Northern California and Southern California, and um, what we focus on is uh, we do 16 to 20 week trainings for people to earn credentials in the CompTIA ITF plus, CompTIA A plus, cybersecurity and cloud. And um, we focus specifically on young adults, ages 18 to 26 and veterans and military connected individuals. So we include reservists, National Guard and spouses in our programs. Um, always focusing on people that are either unemployed or underemployed. So all of our trainees are um, low income. And with that lens, we actually end up getting over 80% are people of color. Um, and that, that's just background to sort of tell you about our work. But what I wanted to raise is the, the tremendous opportunity there is right now to engage all of us that are doing these workforce training programs in um, and getting our trainees working as digital navigators to provide the basic navigation and the basic skills and leverage all of the investment that the state of California is making in apprenticeship to do that. And there's a, there's a couple of different models, but one model I wanted to share that we're doing in um, a couple of other markets is we have a, a community help desk which is staffed by graduates of our programs working in apprenticeships that provides free technical support and digital navigation services to the local community. And it's a platform that is, we don't have to do it just by ourselves. We can partner with uh, many other organizations and really capitalize on the funding that the state of California is putting into apprenticeships, as well as the funding that's going, that's coming from NTIA um, to really sort of be a tide that lifts all ships um, and uh, whatever we can do to sort of share our talent and share our uh, employer partners and um, and just collaborate on things. We're very, very interested in uh, just being a good ecosystem player. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And I, I think it's, I think we think it's a really uh, a great model to share and to acknowledge that div digital navigation programs um, can be unique and um, very tailored to each region. And meaning that 
Um, there is no one model, but that they could be a peer to peer model. They could be like a neighbor to neighbor model, which we heard in our digital literacy and inclusion workshops, or it can be uh, an organization to peer model. So I really love uh, the, the, the information you're sharing about different digital navigation programs, and I, I commend you for all the work that you're doing. Yeah, Nicole, I was thinking the same thing. I just wanted to say that in the in the digital literacy and inclusion working group that we had slightly earlier, um, that folks were again saying that that peer to peer neighbor to neighbor model for digital navigation um, was um, something that they encourage. And Jennifer, what I think I heard you said, which is even slightly different, is that the the apprenticeship trainees that like as they're matriculating and getting there that Part of how they can pay it forward is to then be digital navigators for those who come behind them and um, really seems um, like a, a forward thinking approach and so thanks for sharing that. Well, and the importance of that too in terms of imparting those basic digital skills in the digital navigation services is it's people that came from that community and look like them and sort of know the struggles that they've been through. Um, and the and just a, another push for what we need is platforms for all of us to collaborate and bring our um, assets to the table. Um, you know, so more than just these, um, you know, these these working groups like platforms that kind of navigate people to all of the things that we're all doing. Well, and Jennifer, I'm, I know there's the not the conversation is going to continue, but I think you've really primed up. One of the important calls to action um, that you'll hear about is we've um, we're developing a, a an asset inventory of organizations and um, programs and funding streams that are already kind of working in this space as part of our the digital equity plan we have to turn into the um, NTIA and so we've created a, a digital equity ecosystem mapping tool for like all of these great organizations that are here today to fill it out in like. Put their information together and ideally like beyond informing the digital equity plan we'd like to see that um you know create um you know some kind of digital visualization or resource pages by by state by region by community of like all the folks that are working in this space um to be able to benefit from and and to enable that cross collaboration that you're talking about thank you scott Thank you, Jennifer. And now uh, we will ask Leo. Leo? Yeah, thank you really quick. I appreciate the opportunity as well. Uh, I share a little bit about the pre-apprenticeship program that we have, how we're also building these pipelines for young people in the tech industry. Just wanna give you some stats and I wanna answer the first question. Uh, since I started the program, 500 young people have applied to a program. 300 have enrolled in the program. We have a 90% graduation rate. And as of yesterday, over 250 of them are working in jobs in the tech industry, and 50 of them are enrolled in computer science major through San Francisco State University and City College and extensions like Berkeley, the program, UC Davis, and others. So that is really a model that we're able to implement to really close this digital divide to young people because some of these young people don't have access to the internet. Uh, some of them have qualified to become part of the ACP program. But one of the most exciting things that I want to share with you today is what actions we have been taking to create ecosystems within affordable housing communities. Uh, when I came to this country, I used to live in affordable housing communities. If you're from San Francisco, there was a hard community called Twin Towers in the Visitation Valley area. I grew up in those buildings, and that's the reason why I'm so passionate to always help affordable housing communities. Most recently, in the Bayview Harness Point area, we put together a program called TechPoint. And this was a coalition and collaboration between Google.org, San Francisco Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development, Monkey Brains, and my organization. And we decided to take action by going out into the community. And I'm in the community. Trust me when I say that. There's a lot of CEOs and executive directors that are sitting in an office. And I'm in the Grinches. I'm in the trenches with all my staff, with my team members making decisions on the ground because that's how we create this opportunity to close this three to the buy. So we were out there to develop a blueprint and we identified that this community needed to have access to computers, access to broadband adoption and access to relevant content. 
Well, those three came to a close back in 2018. We reach out to google.org and the city of San Francisco who has access to Fiverr. We were able to implement Fiverr in this community for over 250 housing units on the west side and over 300 units on the east side. So that community right now has free Fiverr broadband access. Then we decided to build an infrastructure for a tech hub. And we build our STEAM hub. We also offer K-12 STEAM opportunities. We also have a digital music lab. We do STEAM days and all these different really cool things. And now we have built a STEAM hub in the community with a full-blown computer lab where families, youth, and kids, and young adults can come and learn the technology skills. But then along the way, we started really identifying how do we train all this community, how to use broadband, how to get access to computers. And to wrap that up, it be, you have to really understand that you cannot be working in silo. And I want to reinforce re that in San Francisco Bay Area and the state of California. If you want to work in silo because you have $50 million in your budget, by all means, make that happen. But if you don't want to work as a silo and have a collective impact approach, that's how we become successful. And we have seen that because we now have access to those opportunities. We even got subsidized employment dollars from the mayor's office to the OFA program. Now we have young people earning a living to give back to the community where they live. And on top of that, now we have tech companies coming to provide volunteer opportunities, corporate responsibility approach to help these low-income families understand how to use technology. And right now we're working with Verizon, AT&T, Comcast, Monkey Brains, and the ACP program to really provide more options for low-income families to get access to the internet. Why do I do that? Because I believe the internet should be a public utility. It should not cost for anybody to pay 30 to 50 to 150 dollars to get access to the internet. We need to change that. Thank you, Leo, for your ex expansion of your in sharing of information about your programs, but also um, really reminding us that it takes a community takes partnership and it's going to be our collective work together to really bridge this digital divide and work towards our state digital equity plan. So thank you again, Leo. And Renee, um, go ahead. You can now unmute. Thank you. I really appreciate the collaboration and um, different um, partnerships that are being profiled on this um, webinar today. I just wanted to share that um, in our region, Valley Vision has also helped facilitate partnerships between the workforce development boards and system and uh, digital skills, digital equity. And part of how that works, well, for one thing, they helped um, provide some funding to the coalition when in the midst of the pandemic, uh, there was a real need to um, invigorate it and expand it throughout the region and help us bring the portal online. So uh, speaking directly to what um, International Rescue Committee brought up, the, we have a large number of refugees in our community, Afghan refugees. And so the portal can be translated into Spanish or Pashto. You can pick a language um, at, the, at the top of the portal, which allows it to um, be approachable to folks in those two languages, which are um, which there's a high percentage of community members in our area. And then in addition, our America's job centers really are the first point of entry for a lot of folks when they come into the country or uh, if they're falling on hard times. And so we've worked with them across the nine county region to adopt North Star digital literacy as a, as a digital literacy assessment that they will do when folks come in. Uh, they've also built in um, device distribution and some of their supportive services offerings. Um, so just again, emphasizing using existing partnerships that are out there where community members are already going to access safety net resources and braiding those together, uh, we found that to be really effective. Thank you. Thank you, Renee, for sharing again so much about kind of partnership and collaboration. Really appreciate your comment. So before we move on, I'm gonna pause to make sure there are not any other hands or any other comments or ideas or program. Oh. This oh. is Laura. How are you? <laughs> Good. Yeah. I wanted to 
make one comment um, just also to recognize because I know that we have some folks in the room that many folks in the room, but I do want to call out um, some that I see before I do that. One of the pieces that I see a lot of energy around is what structures exist to support the partnership and stakeholder engagement, right? So in some of the more established communities, I've, you know, I've heard some of the partners here talk about the importance of digital equity coalitions and coming together to really leverage all of the resources that exist. But we tend to see those in more of the urban areas. And so I'm really excited because I think we have some folks on the call from Merced um, and Merced actually launched their digital equity coalition about a week and a half ago. So that's super exciting. Um, Bitwise is really excited to be a part of that. I, I wanted to call that out because I think often we assume that those coalitions are in place and I think that they are going to be instrumental to these efforts really having a place for the community organizations to come together and talk about the different resources that they each have um, around digital literacy, workforce development, right? And, and what's going to work for their community and what all of that should look like. Um, but that's not um, universally understood. That kind of level of uh, coming together and having a structure that is supported and has a community buy-in is very difficult to put together in the not urban areas. And so I wanna call that out and say, I know Cultiva La Salud is, is here on the call, which is one of the members of the Merced Coalition. So really exciting to see that energy kind of sparking up and how that is gonna be necessary infrastructure as well to drive more resources for that work to happen locally. So Laura, did you, did you want to call out on the person from Merced and are they going to be able to speak? Um, I don't want to put them on the spot. I know <laughs> okay. I see there. Um, I did see that uh, it's there is someone that has the logo. Understood. So that's why I wanted to call it out. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing both on not just the urban, but also kind of uh, uh, groups are doing across the state um, and, and regionally in Merced. So thank you for sharing. We do have some more time for public um, not public comment, but um, community discussion um, and sharing. Does anyone else have any remaining thoughts or comments? Um, if if I may, um, yes. Crystal and I'm at, um, at Cal State University DH. One thing that I'm coming across, and I'm not sure that I hear us talk about it as much as we talk about some of the technical elements is the simplicity of being able to apply for jobs and what is the role in um, kind of this body, right, of people who don't know how to use Adobe. And these are some very basic skills, but it's not right. It doesn't really lead to a certification. So a lot of people aren't really thinking about can a person use a mouse versus the touchpad? So some of these elements really impact workforce development. How many applications can you actually send out? And so I just wanted to kind of bring that into this space um, to talk you know, or even just to mention that there are some very basic level skills that may or may not be addressed. And if so, where? <laughs> where can we maybe share some of these resources? No, that's great, Crystal. And I think one of the things I was before we moved on is really iterate number question number three, which is what's missing, what what programs are needed. So so thank you for sharing that. Um, and cool. before I make oh yep, go yeah, ahead, Scott. Cool. And I'd like to you know, Crystal, thank you for that. We had mentioned earlier that that um, one of the first um, the kind of sets of speakers that that appeared in multiple of the working groups that we're having on the digital equity plan was the national digital skills coalition and they reported out on their findings about um how essentially you know digital skills are required for any kind of job that is out there and that there's kind of three buckets there's the the, the basic there's the intermediate and the advanced skills and so um Thank you for for pointing out that um, that that there are are some pieces like you said about related to applying for jobs and working on an Adobe and things like that. Um, 
it's a good opportunity here to talk about the kind of cross pollinated um, process we have with the digital equity um, planning process because we've established these working groups to really bring the subject matter experts together around the very specific policy outcomes that um, we're hoping that the digital equity plan and the capacity grants will empower. Um, we're also in the, the middle of, we just completed our 10th of 20 regional in-person workshops. And so what a lot of people have brought up um, and those were up in Eureka, for instance, the week before last, there was a community center that um, was um, training youth to, um, you know, put together their resumes and apply for jobs. And they were finding out that these were folks who were putting together resumes on, on mobile phones. And then when they were printing them out, they were, um, the formatting was wrong and that, um, so that they were automatically being disadvantaged when they were applying for jobs. Um, you know, one small thing that's kind of related to that, but some of the suggestions that have come out um, of the workshops as strategies to empower outcomes in both education and workforce development was like embedding um, digital literacy and digital skills training in all levels of schools um, from like K-12 to community colleges to, um, to the CSU and, um, um, and, and the UC system. And so um, that is something that's being um, discussed in kind of the, the different cross-cutting things. And I'm glad you brought it into this space because that will more than likely be, you know, a recommendation that ends up in the in the the draft digital equity plan. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for sharing more. Um, Claudia. Yes. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, happy Wednesday or Tuesday or Thursday. I don't know what day of the week it is anymore. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everyone, for this space um, and for this important conversation. Uh, you know, one of the things that we, we we take technology for granted, right? Like we we are very quick to pick up our phone and and we have access to the internet and we know how to navigate and search for a Wi-Fi. And if that one doesn't work, we're gonna click onto another one. Um, I, I just wanted to share that there, there's still a lot of communities where we don't have that capability. We were just in Los Baños. Los Baños, like Los Baños is a city. And we rented out their Lux and Miller building um, to do some um, COVID relief funds for primary uh, farm workers, $600. So we had a jam-packed house. Um, this is us trying to get some Wi-Fi and some reception as we uploaded uh, their IDs or their pay stubs, we literally had to step outside of the building to get more roaming. So it it dawned on me, you know, we we're not there yet. We we still have a long way to go when it comes to connecting folks to technology, um, especially the Latino community, right? Like we would want them just to take their phone and click on this link and then do your application because it's not that difficult, but we 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 don't have that capacity. So I, I will continue to advocate for training opportunities for Latino, Spanish speaking only uh, community residents to really help empower them and to help get connected and to help them navigate even their own phone, their computer at home, um, and you know, really have these infrastructures where we don't we don't have to be stepping outside of the building and like doing this antenna thing like we did when we were young and we had to move antennas on our TVs. You remember? You remember? Uh, so thank you for that, and we do look forward to um, some of those grants that are going to be released to help us be able to do that. And Claudia, thank you so much for bringing up the issue of access, because we know that, you know, that the state's broadband for all program is really based on access, affordability and adoption are critical for digital equity. And we're both sensitive and empathetic to those places where access is not um, yet possible or it's constrained. And so um, one of the things I um, wanted to to share is that the state has invested about six and a half billion dollars um, 
that um, are are under the broadband for all umbrella. So currently in the process of of constructing and developing a, a like open access middle mile network along the state highway system in all corners of the state um, to empower incumbents, um, new entrants, cities, counties, schools, libraries, um, really anyone to to build further out into the rural areas or in those historically, you know, um, underserved urban communities to create the access that you're talking about. And so the state middle mile program is working concurrently with another, you know, almost $3 billion at the Public Utilities Commission that is providing grants to those last mile providers or other entities um, to, to incent um, getting out connectivity to those areas. So want to make sure that we um, we we acknowledge that we heard what you said and we know that for many communities we can't have a conversation about digital equity without addressing the access issue. Um, and to also say that part of what we're doing here is, um, you know, because we're developing a digital equity plan for the digital equity capacity dollars, we're limited in the eligible uses um, on what we could potentially use those those capacity grants for in terms of like broadband adoption programs or digital navigation programs, um, you know, digital literacy training workforce programs. So um, this is, a, it's a vast um, broadband for all program that has multiple pieces. And we're, um, we thank you for bringing the voices of those communities that where access is still a challenge. Um, and you know, we're, we're collectively working on that piece as well. And, and Deputy Director, I'm just to double down on that. One of the things that I can note is that um, when it's related to Los Banos, um, Highway 152 goes right through the middle of Los Banos and Middle Mile Broadband Initiative, the network goes right down Highway 152 through the middle of Los Banos. So that is um, proposed within the network. So thank you, Claudia, and thank you, Scott Peratti. Um, Jennifer. I was just going to pile on to um, the, the theme that's kind of emerging around uh, basic digital skills and underscore that it's really a continuum. You know, the, the folks who workforce programs like us um, and, and, you know, Bitwise and Calbright are, are looking to engage, you know, to become part of the workforce first they need to build their confidence with digital skills. And just to get to the point where they're ready to sign up for one of our programs, um, they need to begin to build, the, it's not just the digital skills, it's the confidence and being able to envision themselves as being successful um, in the workforce. So it's a, it's a continuum and it's so important that the organizations that are doing the device distribution those that are doing the basic skills and those of us that are doing the, the workforce upskilling are talking to each other and sort of sharing our, our audiences so that we are connecting the pipeline and creating a more diverse workforce overall. Does that make sense? It did. Thank you, Jennifer. I'd, I'd love to second Jennifer's comments and the comments yes. that were Prior because this confidence builder, especially for the demographics that we all have the the opportunity to support, uh, confidence is a big it, 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 it's a it's a big kind of uh, deciding factor, right? And whether folks see themselves in in terms of these equitable uh, opportunities, job opportunities, and so a part of you know our our job at Calbright is not to just skill technically, but to upskill and promote. Um, uh, you know, uh, our students in, in a way that allows them to see themselves in a successful career uh, that will bring along not just themselves, but their entire, uh, their entire family, right? And so uh, that's really a, a core part of our counselors that are onboarded to provide uh, those full kind of wraparound services and us connecting uh, them to other public services uh, that would help strengthen uh, their experience at Crowbright as well. That's that's uh, vitally important. And I'd, I'd also like to call a little bit of attention uh, to doing that work, plus also advocating for public sector careers, right? And so we're working with a core partner and next gen policy, a, a big advocate uh, in terms of equitable placed uh, opportunities. Um, we're working with them to stand up opportunities to to really ensure that folks are prepared for public service careers as well, 
right, in, in terms of having the full kind of protections, representation, and others um, that, that that provides them a, a great opportunity on day one. And so whether that be by apprenticeships, which we're uh, pursuing as well from a public sector standpoint, uh, but also full-time placement. So uh, we're excited about that work, but I, I just wanted to second the, the comments about the confidence building a piece for all the players that are in the ecosystem, knowing that it starts there, um, also addressing um, you know, uh, some some historical trauma that these communities have, have experienced uh, as well. Those are uh, very important uh, attributes that, that really come along with the individual. And so uh, making sure that we have um, systems that incorporate uh, those elements. Michael, thank you so much for not only sharing a comment, but building on comments and listening to the, uh, those that are sharing before us to really kind of have this um, conversational piece. And thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining this community discussion. There is a lot of great information and, and, and really great conversation. Um, but now we're going to pivot uh, to the next slide. Uh, just really next steps with this outcome area working group is to really, we're gonna um, integrate the input that you've all shared, um, both from our outcome area working groups, the regional workshops, the public survey and DEEM tool, which we're gonna cover shortly. We'll then conduct a, a gap analysis, analysis and then develop recommendations for inclusion in the state digital equity plan. Um, so I'm going to jump to the next slide with Miley from Broadband Equity Partnership to really share and, and share some exciting news about both the digital equity ecosystem mapping tool and a digital equity survey. Miley? Thanks so much, Cole. Hi, everyone. My name is Miley Martinez, and I am with the Broadband Equity Partnership. And I'm here to talk to you about two tools that we are using to catalog and capture the amazing work that's happening across the state to drive digital equity and inclusion. So I'm, well, as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking about two tools today. The first is called the Digital Equity Ecosystem Map Mapping Tool, or D-E-E-M, the DEEM tool. This tool is live, as you can see on this slide, and I encourage you to uh, utilize the QR code or the link on the slide to take a look at it today. This, The audience for this tool is really a lot of the folks who are on this call. It's organizations, agencies, um, uh, schools, libraries, and others that are driving digital equity and inclusion through unique programs. So we're trying to capture and catalog that work that's happening across the state. Um, and we're trying to identify the programs that are being offered, where they're being offered, and to whom. And that will also help us to identify what's missing in each region. This is also going to help to identify barriers to achieving digital equity in every county across the state. So this tool, which again, the intended audience is organizations and agencies, it's called the DEEM tool, it's live now, and I encourage you to use the QR code or the link on the slide here, or we will be in the chat in just a moment uh, to check it out. So next slide, please. This tool has been live for a little while now, and so far we have 163 responses. So we're tracking this closely. We know there's a tremendous amount of amazing work that's going on in this space across the state. And with 160 responses, we're really not capturing it yet. You can also see on the right-hand side of this slide, there's a heat map of the state of California. Dark green counties are counties where we've had 11 or more respondents so far. And the red and orange counties are those where we've had zero or one respondent. So we're really looking for help in getting the word out about this survey. If you're um, on this call, we'd love to have you fill it out and also help us spread the word so we can get better representation from across every single county in the state. Next slide, please. So the call to action here is to please complete the DEEM tool. A couple of things I neglected to mention about it. It only takes about 10 minutes. It's available in English and Spanish. It's online. And if you only have a couple of minutes to, to spend on it, even that is really helpful to just get the crucial information about your organization and the work that you're doing. So we'd really appreciate 10 minutes if you can spare it or one to two if that's all you've got. There's yeah. some resources on this slide. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, go ahead and finish up. I was just gonna put it uh, underscore your comment when we were done. 
Oh, thank you. So just a couple of other things up on this slide here. We have a toolkit that can help you promote this uh, resource to your networks and communities. So after you've completed the survey, uh, you can open up the toolkit and easily send an email to send it out to your networks. Uh, there's also a link on this slide to get to the Spanish version, if that's relevant for the communities that you serve. And then finally, we also have a unique DEEM tool for internet service providers. So for the ISPs in your community, um, we'd love to have you promote this tool to them as well, so we can capture the digital equity work that they are driving as well. Got it. Go ahead, Scott. And so, yeah, Miley, I would say if you go back to the next slide uh, or the previous slide, um, so here, I think it was mentioned like creating a platform where we could kind of catalog all of the, the work that folks are doing, create an opportunity for folks to, to see what's going on. Ideally, that's how we're tracking responses to the digital equity ecosystem mapping tool. And, and that's one of the outputs that we're hoping to get to. And so, um, you know, Michael, Jennifer, Leo, Caitlin, Renee, um, you know, um, Mon, Lori, um, all of you folks who have these excellent and wonderful programs, um, we would love to um, capture those in the DEEM tool, um, both to shape the digital equity plan um, to help us figure out how we're gonna, um, oh, and thank you, Jennifer, um, was only just saying you guys are, are examples of folks, folks on this call, but others, and we're issuing the call to action across the state we want to get as comprehensive as a, a scan as possible. You know we're California, we're very ambitious, um, and not just get the workforce and economic development folks, but the education folks, the digital literacy and inclusion, the health navigators that are really interested in moving in this space um, and capture that. So um, I know you're all busy folks, and we've asked a lot of your time in these meetings and in these workshops, um, but this is an important thing that if you haven't, if you can fill it out, we really hope you do. Thanks, Scott. So we can go forward two slides now. So we, I was just talking about the DEEM tool, which again, the audience for that is organizations and agencies. We are also very excited because tomorrow we are gonna be launching another tool, the Digital Equity Online Survey. This is a public tool and it's open to, uh, the audience is really households. So anyone in the state of California who uses the internet or wants to use the internet should, can and should fill out this survey. Uh, as I said, it's going live tomorrow. So this is really a preview. The Digital Equity Online Survey, survey is mobile friendly. So it can be done on a mobile phone. It's available in 14 languages. And for each of those languages, we have built in audio functionality. So that means that people with low vision, people with limited English or literacy in any of those 14 languages can access the tool and hear recordings of the question so that they can participate in it. Uh, it captures information about internet access, affordability, and internet adoption for residents in California households. And again, we could really use your help getting it out to uh, the communities where you live and work, um, and the constituents that you reach, because we want to get a, a very comprehensive picture of folks' experience uh, with broadband and digital access across the state. Yeah, so, and I would just add, Miley, that and part of a call to action here is that um, with the information, we, we'd like to get as many responses as possible. We're doing a phone survey, um, and that's going to be really scientific, but working through, you know, partners like you all, through your networks, to your clients, to your customers, to your constituents, um, really um, hoping to get the, 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 the voice of, of the residents in here and not just identify the barriers, but the needs. And there's some cool functionality in this survey as well. I did it on my mobile phone. It took me about, um, uh, you know, eight minutes and I know um, Claudia was talking about the folks in Los Banos that didn't have the online connectivity. Like I said, it is accessible via mobile phone. And um, we do have a, actually a speed test built into this. So to the extent you can encourage folks you're working with to um, you know, do that, it's an open source speed test where um, folks get you know, kicked over to another um, area, test their speeds and then enter them in. It's a lot of good um, you know, regional and local data will be 
helpful for the state to have the aggregated information, but it's, you know, information that once we test and verify it, we'll, um, you know, be willing to share some of that out with the regional and local folks to help inform, um, you know, uh, the digital equity efforts in, in regions and areas as well. And I just saw a question in the chat about um, sharing out this information over email following this call. Yes, absolutely. You'll have access to all the links that you've seen on your screen. Um, and we want to facilitate your both um, taking of these surveys and promotion of them to your communities. So that is coming over email. Um, with this, I think we'll go to a very quick demonstration of each of these tools. So we'll start with the DEEM tool. And this, again, is the tool that targets organizations and agencies. Um, looking for them to share the um, share information about the programs and services that you offer when it comes to digital equity and inclusion and those that you could offer. Uh, one thing I just want to highlight about this, if you scroll up to the top quickly, um, there, this is where in the upper right-hand corner you can easily switch uh, from English to Spanish. So this tool is available online in two languages. And uh, again, it takes about 10 minutes to fill out. Uh, and if you spend, if you only have time for the first page, this is extremely helpful for us, but we encourage you to do the whole thing and, uh, and help us spread the word about this tool uh, to other agencies and organizations across the state. And then I think we can quickly move to the other tool, which is, again, this is a preview. So this uh, public survey, which takes about 10 minutes, is going to go live tomorrow. Um, and as you can see in the upper right-hand corner, you can choose from 14 languages. Uh, and one of the really great things about this tool is that in addition to the written um, instructions and questions in those 14 languages, there's also audio. So uh, we'll do a quick demonstration of that in Tagalog. Okay. California. So for every question you can, thank you. The user can select the play button and hear an audio recording of the questions um, and answer options, uh, whether on their mobile phone or on their laptop or desktop. So again, we'll be sharing uh, via email as a follow-up, all the links, resources, a link to the toolkits to promote these tools. And we really appreciate your help both in taking the surveys and promoting them. Um, and I'd also like to open the floor. I saw in the chat that there's some folks who have already participated and have been spreading the word, which we of course very much appreciate. And we'd love to hear your feedback about your experience with, with um, the DEEM tool so far, since that's the only one that's live. And we'll be asking for your feedback on the public survey when it goes live too. So anything to share about your experience using the DEEM tool? I thought it was great. The that I it took me longer than 10 minutes because we offer multiple services and I ended up there were there were a couple of places where we checked too many boxes and it was we ended up entering the same information. Um and so that was the only if, if there's some way to shortcut that, um that would be helpful. But otherwise it was a really simple, straightforward, easy to use, um, and a nice interface. Jennifer. I have a question about the survey. So um, as I mentioned before, this is Anissa from IRC in San Diego. We have different departments that, that offer different types of services and some of them don't overlap. Would it be useful for each department, even though it's the same organization or would you prefer just in general? Like how granular do you want us to go? Miley, can I um, jump Please. in here? I think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I know Rich is on, but her voice is um, feeling heard today. Um, the, uh, uh, there's a pre-read on the Broadband for All portal, Anissa, for organizations like yours that might have multiple entities or multiple programs. And I believe you can just, um, you could pre-print that out and kind of, you know, assign one person to kind of, you know, track everything down that you want to report out and then um, submit it all as one and, and potentially link out to the programs. Rich, did I get that right? Uh, yes, thanks, Scott. And uh, Anissa, I just wanted to add 
that if you produce annual reports that include information about your program, we've got a, um, an option for you to just upload those annual reports and we can filter that information as well. So that would really help us. Whatever reports that you have, just go ahead and, and share them with us. Well, we welcome any additional feedback or questions about both the Dean tool and the Digital Equity Online Survey when it goes live. And we really appreciate your partnership and, and help in participating in them and getting the word out about them. So thank you. Yeah, and Miley, I know you wrapped up, but I hate to be the guy that keeps extending the conversation. Um, I'm wondering, do we wanna talk about one of the things that I believe you guys built into the the to the latest iteration of the Dean tool is like, we heard at the top, um, I believe it was Bitwise that said, hey, we've got this great, you know, partner in Cultiva Salud that we're working with. Um, there's also an ability for like an umbrella organization or a larger organization to submit information on behalf of a partner organization. Um, is that correct? That is correct. So if you are a larger organization and you work with smaller entities, you can actually fill out the DEEM tool on behalf of those smaller entities. We understand that small nonprofits sometimes don't have um, the bandwidth to do this. And so if you can help with, with your partner entities, that would be amazing. That would be super helpful. Okay, Miley, I think that's my last interruption, sorry. No, by all means, I was just, I'm just mindful of the time and really appreciate ever, the time everybody's already given to this conversation. So thanks so much. I think with that, I can throw it back to Cole. Okay, next slide. So just a, a reiteration of the, the next steps. Um, we have uh, upcoming state digital equity planning events, both virtual and in-person. These are the next virtual events, uh, both statewide digital planning group meetings and the outcome area working group meetings in June and July and October. Next slide. Uh, additionally, these are in-person event, events and they have, uh, we've had about eight to nine that we've already done and they've been across the state, uh, all the way up in Eureka, all the way down to San Diego. So we look forward to joining um, you in your region and meeting you in person. They've been super fun. Uh, and like I see in the comments, super excited about the collaboration. These have the, been um, awesome and fun in that way. Next slide. Reiteration of the calls to action, really, really putting out the call to complete the digital equity ecosystem mapping tool. It sounds like a lot of you have, super appreciative. Um, continue those for those that have not. Um, they are both in the chat and on the portal, Broadband for All portal, um, and you'll receive information in a follow-up email with links. When we do have the Digital Equity Public Survey live tomorrow, uh, please uh, fill it out yourself, uh, share it with your friends, your family, your networks. We will send not only toolkits um, with social media collateral, but also information um, for you to share out to your networks participate in the next outcome area working group, and please attend a, a planning workshop in your region. We'd love to meet you in person. Next slide. With that, here's some contact information. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for today's uh, May outcome area working group meeting. The next workforce and economic development outcome meeting will be on June 14th at 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, please stay involved in the process. You can visit us at the Broadband for All portal to sign up for our email newsletter. Uh, and thank you for your continued engagement, uh, lively participation today in our outcome area working group, really appreciative. And we look forward to you to join more of our state's digital equity planning efforts. Uh, with that, we will say thank you in recording and see you.